Hey, welcome to worship and welcome to Holy Trinity this morning. We are really glad that you are here. On behalf of Pastor Katie and our entire council and our entire worshiping community, thanks for joining us today here online. I'm Pastor Tim and delighted to welcome you to this chance to explore our rich theme of calling today, our new series that we've been exploring for the last couple of weeks. We're also going to be celebrating communion a little bit later on, so a reminder to have some bread and wine and crackers and juice perhaps available uh, for you if you'd like to participate. But let's just first take a chance just to be community together. If you're listening on Facebook, go ahead and comment if you can and greet each other, those, the individuals who are worshiping with us this morning. It might feel a little bit awkward, a little weird at first, but if you get into the habit, it does really help us to be able to celebrate celebrate that sense of being community together. But remember, too, this morning we're also going to be uh, resuming Sunday school for our younger students. That's, again, going to be here uh, in front of you on Zoom each Sunday at 10 a.m. And our adult forum also will resume this morning at 10 a.m. The links for both of those are going to be found uh, in our Friday e-blast if you'd like to join in. We also have a Next Steps conversation taking place at 8 a.m. on Sundays for those who would perhaps be interested in exploring other questions of faith from a different angle or, again, learning more about uh, our, us here at the Holy Trinity. So come and join us. All, again, all access to all those things are found on the e-blast. We also want to remind you that two other special opportunities are going to be starting up this week. One of those is Alpha next Monday, and then Financial Peace University, too, next Sunday evening. Those are both going to be starting with a Financial Peace University resources available at a discount this year. So great time to participate. See our website or see our newsletter for more information about how to take part in those. Lastly, looking ahead to our virtual annual congregational meeting coming up on Sunday the 31st of January this year, we're going to be preparing for that by doing a number of things. One, we have our annual report booklets that are going to be available either electronically on our website, accessed by a password you can get from the office, or we also have print copies available. We'll have those available for you on Monday afternoon. So just a reminder that those are both options for you. But we're going to be preparing for the meeting, too, by doing something else. And that's next Sunday at 11 a.m. We have a special session that we're going to be offering, again, on Zoom, being able to uh, do two things. One, learning the, 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 the aspects of Zoom that are helpful to use in terms of how you can participate best. If you're not familiar with it, it's a great tutorial. It's also going to be a chance for us to go through some question and answer time with the proposed operating budget for 2021. So both of those things happening 11 a.m. next Sunday. We hope you can be part of that. So with all that behind us, let's now take a moment to center ourselves again with a moment of quiet, readying our hearts uh, to offer them up to God in worship today. As we do once again this morning, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Join me now, would you, as we sing our opening hymn. Thank you. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, we give thanks for a chance to gather as your people this morning, to be reminded both who and whose we are. We know that you have come and promised to be with us however we gather, whether virtually or in person or any other way. And so we welcome your presence again today. God, fill us collectively with the presence of your Holy Spirit. And then call us to that distinctive walk of faith that isn't always easy, isn't always obvious, but is so rich and meaningful when we follow your lead. We look to you for your example. And so come, God, today. Once again, join us in our worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, boys and girls. It's great to have you be back in, in, in our children's sermon this morning. We're glad to welcome you back. I know some of you are, are back in school already, and others of you are perhaps getting ready to go back to school, and I hope that you can uh, feel excited about that, perhaps. I also know that on your classroom walls that you have in your classroom, many times your teacher will have a poster that might look something like this. It's a poster that explains what the rules for the class might be. And those rules sometimes seem pretty simple. Look with your eyes, learn with your ears, quiet mouths, etc., etc. You know what? I used to be a little bit of a smart aleck sometimes in class, and so I would look at those rules, and I would think, how could I try to honor those on the one hand, but push my luck on the other? Maybe I would listen with my ears, but I'd also be talking with my mouth. Or maybe I would be having a quiet mouth, but I'd be making noise with some other part of my body, you know? That sort of thing. And the key is this. These rules are not something that your teacher gives you just to be mean, right? Why do you think they have those up there on the wall? What purpose do they serve for you in your classroom? I think here's the key. Your teacher gives you some boundaries like that so that you have an environment in which you can learn and so that your neighbor can learn, so all of you can learn together. They have a different idea in mind than just telling you what to do, than just being the boss, as it were, in that classroom. The same is true of your parents. They may give you some boundaries at home, some responsibilities at home, not to be mean, but to teach you things that might not be so obvious at first because they want the best for you too. When God gives us rules, he gives them to us too as part of a bigger picture, right? Not just to, again, say, this is the way it will be, but to help us have a chance to experience something much more beautiful and much richer. In one of his explanations of those rules, he says, so that your days may be long, so that your life may be rich, so that you might have a chance to be blessed in this journey and not just following orders. So today, when you see that list of rules on your classroom, or the next time your parents tell you something they want you to do, Think of the bigger picture and what that creates for us, the bigger possibilities that that makes possible for us, that we can, in fact, live the life God wants us to be able to live, that we can learn what our teachers would love us to learn, that we can be who God's created us to be. Let's pray. God, thanks again for giving us rules, boundaries that we have in our life as gifts that they might help steer us in a path where we can discover how it is that you have in fact created life, that they can serve a much bigger picture to help us grow and learn and thrive and be the people you want us to be. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us for the message today. The first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it's spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with, I'd be a slave to my whims. You know the old saying, first you eat to live, and then you live to eat. Well, it may be true that the body is only a temporary thing, but that's no excuse for stuffing your body with food or indulging it with sex. Since the master honors you with a body, honor him with your body. God honored the master's body by raising it from the grave. He'll treat yours with the same resurrection power. 
Until that time, remember that your bodies are created with the same dignity as the master's body. You wouldn't take the master's body off to a whorehouse, would you? I should hope not. There's more to sex than mere, mere skin on skin. Skin is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we want to become spiritually with one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies, these bodies that were made for God-given and God-molded love, for becoming one with one another. Or didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a higher price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. So let people see God in and through your body. The second reading is from John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. When he got there, he ran across Philip and said, Come, follow me. Philip's hometown was Bethsaida, the same as Andrew and Peter. Philip went and found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote of in the law, the one preached by the prophets. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathanael said, Nazareth? You've got to be kidding. But Philip said, come see for yourself. When Jesus saw him coming, he said, there's a real Israelite, not a false bone in his body. Nathanael said, where did you get that idea? You don't know me. Jesus answered, one day long before Philip called you here, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus said, You've become a believer simply because I say I saw you one day sitting under the fig tree? You haven't seen anything yet. Before this is over, you're going to see heaven open and God's angels descending to the Son of Man and ascending again. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hey, good morning, and welcome back to our recent sermon series exploring the theme of calling and what it means to relearn how to be a follower of Christ. I was uh, pondering uh, the lessons for this week, and it had me uh, be pretty quickly mindful of an incident that took place a little bit earlier in the week between my wife and I. We had been having this conversation, and I ended up saying something that was really quite insensitive. And then afterward, my apology for that while it was technically there in words, it, it felt like kind of like a get out of jail free card. You know, it just didn't quite capture the spirit that needed to be captured in that. And to follow that up, I then followed up with an explanation of why I said it in the first place. And of course, that wasn't being asked for, and that did not help matters in the least. It was one of those living illustrations of how one can oftentimes technically keep the letter of the law but miss the spirit of it. Or for that matter, we can keep the letter of the faith and miss the spirit of it. Maybe a good example of how we can perhaps do the right thing sometimes, but, but do it in a way that, that really misses the point of trying altogether. In that light, I think it's pretty easy for us to, to, to turn this Christian faith that we share literally into more of, the, of a rule book than anything else, where following Jesus just gets boiled down to being nice or staying in your lane or collecting all the right, maybe spiritual merit badges, as it were, where being a Christian is reduced to, to joining the right party or denomination, maybe. Or, or Again, there's just lots of ways that we can, we can reduce this down to something less than it's intended to be. And we have to ask, 
about any one thing, you know, what has that got to do with Jesus? Or how does merely towing the line fit within a much larger ethic that he may perhaps have modeled for us, right? The epistle text today hints at that really well, where Paul says, you know, just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it's spiritually appropriate. I think that's really wise. Maybe sometimes it's a matter of, again, the idea of doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg showed us long ago that just because, again, doing something just to stay out of trouble, for instance, doesn't probably really demonstrate the highest level of, of moral development for any one of us. Or how we might sometimes also be prone to maybe doing something, maybe just to feel good about ourselves, which is laden with all kinds of traps, including that of, of self-righteousness. So it's not that I or others are suggesting that rules or laws don't have their place. They certainly do whether in terms of, of society as a whole or, or certainly in terms of the faith or our discipleship. But I'd like to make the case here that Jesus is calling us to something far more significant, far more fulfilling. And that's a whole vision, right? Not just a rule book, a vision. A vision of life and of life together. And that vision goes way beyond just, just, just marching in step with specific behavior. It goes way beyond the idea of just coloring within the lines, right? It's an invitation to honor the spirit of what he's inviting us to and not just the letter. A challenge to, to live out the broader vision of this, what this life might look like and, and not just one isolated aspect of it on its own taken out of context with the larger whole. Consider this teaching of Jesus is found in the fifth chapter of Matthew where he says, you know, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What exactly do you think Jesus meant by that? Let's maybe think aloud about that for just a moment. I mean, the Pharisees certainly were teaching the law of Moses. They were well known for it, well regarded for that. So how was their own righteousness lacking? What part of the whole situation were they missing? I wonder if Jesus didn't mean very several different things about this when he spoke to them. Obviously, he had come to fulfill the ancient prophecy about how the Son, and Son of God was going to come into our midst. That part seems pretty clear. But on a much deeper level, he'd also come to show us the rationale behind the law, the purpose that lay behind it, the why it was necessary, and to help us understand again that what that might look like if it was lived out in pure living color to the ultimate. He pointed out that while the Pharisees were teaching the letter of the law, to be sure, they, they were not always grasping the more important spirit of the law. They might be eager to, again, point out the speck in somebody else's eye, how they were failing to keep within the lines, but they couldn't see the log in their own. Pretty good, huh? One prime example of, from Jesus' own life is the story from John chapter 5 about the, the man who came to Jesus next to the pool of Bethesda, and he'd been an invalid for, get this, 38 long years. Think about that. In that day and age, it's an entire lifetime. 38 years, this man had been ailing, had been outside of his community. People had questioned his integrity, his morality, all of that because of his illness. He was an outcast, and he had no sense of community, chances are. But the Pharisees then came to that scene and, and chastised both the man and Jesus in that situation, and doing so for working on the Sabbath, all right? First, they, they chastise the man for carrying his mat, of all things. Then they get on Jesus' case for healing him. Because the law said that the Sabbath must be kept holy, the commandment based on the creation story, where God rested on the Sabbath after six days of hard work. 
We can understand the need for that, Lord knows. Right? That was meant to be a gift that, that was meant to say, you know, you have permission to rest once in a while. It was inherently logical that one should follow God's example, use that day of Sabbath to praise God, to rest one's body for the work to be done the rest of the week. We get that. But so what was the issue here? Well, you know, we're talking about a beloved child of God. We're talking about someone who hasn't even been able to really live, period, for two decades, for, two, two, uh, for four decades, excuse me. He's, he's, he's a man who's been broken, who's been cast off, who's been a no one for most of his life. And here the Pharisees come and say, no, 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 you can't do that. What Jesus does is he says, you know what? Sabbath has its place, absolutely. But so does work. <laughs> and if I'm working by restoring this man's dignity and health and life and reputation and, and relationships and places in the larger community, so be it. That fits the vision of what he understood God to be about. And so what does he say to the Pharisees? He says, you know, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Once again, the challenge then as now was to live out the broader vision of what this calling looks like. This calling to live in the spirit of Christ. This calling to live as part of a community of grace rather than just one isolated aspect of it. That's what Lutherans mean when we, you speak of calling in many ways. The thing is, we probably won't really get what that might look like. We probably won't really begin to understand what it is that Jesus is asking of us until we start risking that kind of following. Right? That's where our, our gospel lesson comes in today. We're Come and see is the invitation that gets offered, both by Jesus to his disciples and, for that matter, from one disciple to others. Come and see. You know, you may be struggling with this a little bit. You may not be able to grasp it. That's understandable. Come and learn what it might look like and feel like. Come and, and be part of something so different that you're not going to be able to grasp or imagine it until you walk behind him. And try it on your own. You know, if you're just going to be trying to stay within the boundaries of the law, that says there's no way to catch that vision. We simply can't do it with that alone. We have to see a broader picture. We have to see beyond. Note also what Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say, you know, first meet my acid test of, of what it means to be faithful or first believe me without reserve or first, you know, rid yourself of all jealousy or ambition or sin. First go learn everything there is to learn then, then set foot out with me. No, he doesn't say that at all. He just says, come and see. Come and experience not just a set of rules or guidelines, that in and of themselves might be wise, might be practical, but are dead and of themselves. But a vision of how those might be lived out and what they might, in fact, lead to. I think of that epistle text from Paul today where he talks about a vision of, of what our bodies are about, right? Not just, a, not just a, a, tra a trap that we're held within, as people of his day oftentimes looked at, but as a temple, as something sacred, as something holy. And they weren't just things to kind of keep within boundaries for boundaries' sake. No, God wanted relationship with us, and he wanted us to experience meaningful relationship with one another. And so he gave us so this great gift to be able to, to touch one another, to let one another know that we are loved in all kinds of ways, that we are beautiful, that we are attractive, that we mean something to someone. And it was such a different gift than just coloring within the lines. Right? It reminds me, too, of what Luther meant when he wrote his explanation to the Ten Commandments. 
where he looked at them and looked at them not through a negative lens so much, but as a preventative, but through a positive, proactive lens. They're a brilliant example. So how God didn't just forgive or forbid certain behaviors, but encouraged a proactive and responsible ones. What does he say? He says, don't just refrain from killing, but, but help your neighbor protect their safety and their dignity. Don't just resist the urge to steal what, what isn't yours, but actively help your neighbor keep what is rightfully theirs and their means to a living for that matter. Help them protect it. And his, really, his insight really opens our eyes, I think, to what lies behind those commandments. Not the letter, but the vision. Not just what it says, but what it points to in terms of a larger purpose. You know, let's face it, the, the popular image of Christians in our culture right now seems to be a long ways from that, and we've got our work cut out for us. And I suppose in some ways we've earned some of that suspicion and dismissal when we've maybe just reduced the faith down to morality alone. We do that too often. We oversimplify what the gift has been meant to be for us. But again, when God paints a picture for us, he paints a picture that isn't just meant to limit what we do or to have us point out and limit what other people ought to be doing, but rather he points towards something much richer, much more meaningful, much more sacred as the vision of life and of life together. We're not going to do it perfectly, Lord knows. We are a nation and a church of sinners. We are a fallen people who, who, who don't get it right, who don't live it out the way we'd like to, who usually don't grasp the big picture. When we see someone crossing the line, we're rather eager to point our own fingers instead of examining our own guilt, our own complicity, our, our own enabling of one sin or another. It's not about doing this perfectly but it's about risking it by falling in step with Jesus, coming and seeing where it, in fact, might lead. I can't help but think of the classic example of Gandhi, who at one point in his life was asked by someone why he, he what, 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 what would it be that would, would help him create, uh, help him become a Christian? He was not a, a Christian at that point in time at all. And, and Gandhi, who was known for a lot of his wisdom, said, you know, um, I think Christians, was his answer. People who, who really truly live out the values that were revealed by Jesus the Christ in his life, including his humility. And then when asked why he hadn't yet become a Christian, Gandhi's answer was also Christians. You know, when it comes to trying to have a connection with Christ in this and understanding the sense of what that vision might look like. God gives us so many good gifts and so many good examples. When it comes to that conversation with my wife and I stopped and thought about the vision right, of, of what I had been called to, what I had been invited to, what I had been privileged to share, my response, chances are, would not have been what it was. And even if I had said it very, very unkindly in the first place, I might have stopped myself and then simply saying, I'm sorry. I might have stopped and owned what had happened. I might have stopped and felt what my beloved felt. And I might have had a chance to again create a bit of that vision right then and right there. Yes, God gave us commandments and boundaries to be sure. He gave us those as gifts, those not as excuses. God provided us with a vision for life and one that went way beyond rules for rules' sake. He gives them to us, and even says it very explicitly after one of the commandments, so that your days might be long and rich and meaningful, so that your purpose in being created in the first place is, is fostered and nourished, so that you can actually taste and experience the kind of grace and life for which I died, the, the same kind of life I lived out before your very eyes. And my own person, for those 33 years that I walked among you. Jesus invites us 
today again to come and see. Come and experience. Don't settle for walking along the edge. Don't settle for staying on the outside. Don't settle for just keeping the letter of the law. Rather, cut loose. Come and see. And let me show you what life can be and is meant to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And now as we celebrate once again the Lord's coming to us, the child at Bethlehem, but also coming to us today in bread and wine, let's first pray for the church, pray for the world, pray for all those who seek God and serve their neighbor. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of your son and his willingness not just to teach the law, but to live it, to live it out in spirit more than letter. It's so easy for us, Lord, to miss the point of your teaching or to think too simplistically or too literally about what you would share with us, what you would show us. Open our, our minds, open our eyes, our ears, and our imaginations to what we might discover anew today, God, that 
we might follow you ever more closely today. And Father, as our nation experiences a transition in administrations and in power, help all of us to remember we are in this together. Help us to avoid labels and assumptions and stereotypes. Help us to risk nurturing, listening, and understanding. And then guide President-elect Biden and his staff to carry out their duties while mindful of your calling and your claim upon them. May they walk humbly with you. Jesus, we pray for those charged with keeping the peace, those whose work is deemed essential and must venture into situations where they are daily at risk, for our healthcare workers, our service technicians, our grocery employees and delivery drivers, so many others upon whom we are daily dependent. That we might treat them with dignity, might not take them for granted, and might do our part to keep them safe and from feeling overwhelmed. We pray again today to God for those struggling to find work or affordable housing or health insurance or simply enough to create a safety net for the inevitable needs or crises that come our way, that all of them, each of your children, Lord, might have cause for hope and cause for dignity. We pray for those we know to be in special need of your healing touch today, Father, including Bill and Elizabeth and Bob and all who are being treated for cancer. We pray for John and Marilyn and Mary Lou and all who are recovering from recent illness or surgery, for Jeanette and hospice care, for those in prisons and living in congregate arrangements, for the families of the many victims of COVID across our state, for Larry as he grieves the loss of his dad, and for all we name before you in our hearts, Lord. Grant your healing touch both to those close to us and those we may never meet, that all might know your presence. And then finally, oh God, just for all the many petitions that we might dare to raise before you now, whether just spoken with our our lips or in a whisper or just within the quiet of our hearts. Whatever our need And whatever our longing, O Lord, hear these petitions on behalf of ourselves or others and sustain us again as we celebrate your Lord's coming anew. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. At a time when his disciples were very much in need of reassurance, Jesus came and stood among them after the resurrection and offered them a gift. He said, my peace be with you. So may the peace of the risen Lord be with you. Let's take a moment and share now both a sign and a word of that presence with those with whom you may be gathered this morning. And now with the whole church, let us together confess our brokenness, our sins, before God and before one another. For if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed, both by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, Lord. Renew us and lead us so that we might delight in your will and that we might walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our God, who is ever rich in mercy, loved you and I even when we were dead to sin and therefore made us alive together in Christ. So by grace, you and I have been saved. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ might live in your hearts today through faith. Amen. We now join in celebrating our Lord's Supper, this meal of hope, 
to which you are invited to stay. It's a meal celebrated on the Jewish day of Passover when Jesus celebrated it first with his disciples and at a time when his disciples were likely feeling really uncertain and really confused and really unsure. A time, in many ways, kind of like our own day in that sense. And today you're invited to, to remember and celebrate that Lord's Supper with the people around you and around us this morning Again, with the whole congregation and with the global church, for that matter, we invite you to gather your elements if you have not already done so. And so the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. Once again, Father, it's our privilege in our delight. It's our duty that we join together today to offer you the gift of our worship and to welcome your presence once again, recalling again all the many ways in which you worked through Jesus to show us a vision of life and of life together, and reminding us that you seek to still work through us too today as the body of Christ at work in your world to do the same for our neighbors. We're reminded that in nights in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat for this is my body which is now given up. Given up for you. So do this to remember me. And then again, after supper, Jesus also took the cup. After giving thanks once more, he gave it too for all to drink and said, take and drink, each of you. This cup is the new promise, the new covenant in my blood shed for you now, for that matter, shed for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this too, would you, for the remembrance of me. And now let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught those first disciples and teaches us to pray today. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now we invite you to commune the individuals around you starting by taking the bread and the elements and saying, the body of Christ given for you. And after you've shared that portion, take your cup, hand it to them and say, the blood of Christ shed for you. And so, indeed, once again, may these great gifts of our Lord's body and our Lord's blood bless you, strengthen you, encourage you to be about God's work this week. Amen.
Hey, thanks so much again for being part of our worshiping community today. We really miss being able to see you face to face, but we're glad that at least you can see us. A reminder to stick around on Zoom today for Sunday School and for Adult Forum, and a reminder that next Sunday we start Financial Peace University, the Monday following Alpha Class on Monday night. We hope that you can be part of any or all of that. Meanwhile, may you go in peace to love and live and share Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.